welcome to the Someone Summer podcast. It's Friday, July 31st, and I'm your host, Nicole. This is episode 38. This episode is brought to you by Polycultured Pantry, our small batch apothecary. We make medicinal tinctures, homemade vinegars, herb-infused skincare products, and more, utilizing what we have grown and foraged. In addition to creating informative content about a variety of topics, including organic agriculture, composting, seed saving, herbalism, and permaculture strategies, we feel strongly about making medicine for our communities. If you enjoy this content and are interested in purchasing our products, please support us by going to www.polyculture.com slash order. I wanted to make this episode because I get tons of requests about how to make your own medicinal tinctures. And I think it's information that everyone should know, because essentially tinctures are a form of preserving your harvest, and that is valuable because it allows you to get the most out of what you've taken from the earth. And we already know the harms that come with destroying natural habitats, so if you're going to take from a natural source, you respect it by extracting and preserving it. It's also a really effective way to get the medicine you need, and every ecosystem has an abundance of herbs, whether they are plant or fungi, to choose from. For me, this represents that there is no lack, only abundance, and the more people that become empowered to make medicine for their own communities, the better. I started this journey making tinctures for myself because I thought it was the next step on my own personal healing journey, and that's what really introduced me to this long history of women as medicine makers, and that there are herbs for every ailment as well as herbs for every stage of our menstrual lives, including childbirth and postpartum. This knowledge empowered me to start sharing my medicine with my friends, and after years of practicing, I finally decided to share my tinctures with the larger community, and that feels really good. Now, the concept of herbalism is huge. There are many books on the subject which detail everything from how to forage and harvest earth medicine, all the way to making extractions of their medicinal or flavorful compounds. If you're interested in learning this skill, it's going to take a while, and it's going to take lots of practice but I think you'll find its value rather quickly once you begin taking the medicines that you've made for yourself. In episode 36, Intro to Foraging, I went over concepts such as gardening versus foraging, rituals for plant communication, ecological harvesting protocols, harvesting equipment, what to harvest and when, how to identify your herbs properly, and preserving your herbs if you're going to be drying them. This knowledge, I believe, is the foundation of making any potent earth medicine from scratch. And today I'm going to start off where we left off in that episode. So I'll talk about the tools you'll need for making your own medicine, how to prepare the herb for extraction, the different kinds of solvents and their actions, the constituents within earth medicines, and how to make basic extractions. So let's get right into it. There are a multitude of parts of the herb that you can utilize for extraction including the roots, stems, barks, leaves, flowers, saps, fruits, seeds, and what we call the herb or the whole plant. And you also have the choice of using dry versus fresh herbs. So now that you've gathered your material, what is next? We call this first step garbling. Garbling means to remove all excess stems and twigs, impurities and other decayed or deteriorated parts of the plant which could contaminate the usable portions. If using fresh material, this also includes removing any insects or eggs on them. Garbling is a meticulous but necessary step, and similar to other monotonous activities, it can actually become a meditation. It can also be done in community with others, which makes for lighter work and a festive atmosphere. You will need some other basic tools to make your extraction, starting with jars and bottles. These are used to hold, blend, shake, seal, and store your herbs. Canning jars are my go-to because they're glass and they come in a variety of sizes with lids that can be replaced when they become kind of scuzzy over time. I prefer amber or cobalt glass bottles for finished extractions to provide a shield from damaging sunlight which can deteriorate your medicine faster. You can collect unique artisanal bottles as well, and some people feel that this brings another element to their craft and makes the sharing of these medicines even more special. The second thing you'll need is a rubber spatula, useful for getting every bit of material out of your containers. You'll also want a coffee grinder, which really helps to chop and powder herbs quickly. 
You can't really use them with hard materials, but they're convenient for getting a fine chop when you really need it fast. You'll also want to invest in a mortar and pestle. These are useful for pulverizing roots, barks, and other tougher woody materials. Measuring cups are essential for getting your ratios correct. Then if you choose a measuring cup with a pour spout, they can make the process of filling your bottles a lot easier. I recommend lid grips as well. Many times herbs, herbs contain sticky constituents, and that means your tincture lids are going to get stuck. I mean, really stuck. <laughs> so you might want to have some lid grips handy, especially if you don't have the most arm strength like me. You also want strainers to separate your spent herbs from the saturated finished tincture, and you can try them in a variety of mesh sizes. Sieves and flour sifters can work well for this, as well as chinoise or cheesecloth. Funnels are useful for getting liquids into smaller containers. Mixing bowls are useful for the garbling process, blending different dried herbs together, and a variety of other uses. Metric scales are practical and useful when doing ratios for extraction. And you might also want to invest in a yogurt thermometer. These are useful for monitoring the temperature during the digesting process of extraction, especially when doing oil infusions that are particularly temperature dependent. And there are other tools you can utilize, such as stirrers, double boilers, crock pots, dehydrators, blenders, flame spreaders, and much more, honestly. But I think the above list is pretty much what you're gonna need for the basics of different extractions with minimal tools. Now the fun part, extraction. It's rather amazing to think about how our ancestors first discovered the use of herbal medicine, most likely by placing fresh or dried herbs in water to extract their constituents and applying heat came soon afterwards. Later on, preserving herbs in wine and vinegar would become commonplace. Ethyl alcohol was not available until the distillation of wine in the 12th century but it only took around 400 years for alcohol extraction to become widespread. Sadly, by the 18th century, allopathic medicine started to discourage the extraction of the whole herb matter in favor of isolating active ingredients in what would become the pharmaceutical industry. And thus herbal medicine making became devalued. Um, it was considered folkloric and layman. Despite the advancements in modern pharmacology, there is still much to be valued about the ancient extraction methods of infusions, decoctions, concentrates, and tinctures. What matters most with these methods are the intent of the harvester and their relationship with the plant and the joy that you infuse into the work that you're doing. Unlike the rigidity of pharmaceuticals, making herbal medicine is adventurous, personal, and artistic. You're able to use your own unique style and you don't have to strictly follow the guidelines that are being presented to you. As you build your skills, you'll find that there are several ways of doing the same thing and you can explore all of them. The most important mantra to accept in this process is the following. Quote, My herbal extracts can never be any better than the quality of the herbs I begin with. Now I'm going to talk about menstruum. These are liquid solvents and their actions. You might be wondering why it's called a menstruum, and so I did a little digging into the etymology to find out. We call a solvent for an herbal extraction a menstruum from the Latin words menstrus for monthly and mensis for month. Why is this? Because menstruum was actually an analogy comparing a base metal being turned to gold to menstruation's effect on the ovum, basically saying that the blood is the solvent of new life. Being a menstrual health educator, I find this endlessly fascinating. So in this process of extraction, there are seven main menstrua, and there are actually a lot more than that, but these are really the, the core seven. The first is water, the universal element and the most important product of nature to sustaining life on earth. Water is stable and predictable, abundant, versatile, and reliable, as well as inexpensive. Unfortunately, because of the irresponsibility of humans, we have to clean our water through the filtration methods before using it. Water is the best solvent we have available to us, but it is not a preservative, and this is its biggest disadvantage. 
So consider experimenting with different types of water, such as rainwater versus distilled water, to see what you like best. Ethyl alcohol, on the other hand, is the best preservative we have available to us. It is also stable, reliable, consistent, and works as both a solvent and a preservative. Decomposition is greatly slowed when immersed in alcohol, leading to an increase in shelf life, and it also eliminates any microbial activity. However, alcohol is more selective in its extraction action and doesn't have as wide of a solubility range as water does. Then there's wine and vinegar. These are other common menstrua and they're primarily comprised of water. Wine has alcohol and vinegar has acid. These additions help in their preservation factor. However, they are less consistent because they do have some vegetable matter within them which can begin to change their nature and therefore change their chemistry and affect the preservation of the herbal compounds. This means these two menstrua are less reliable in terms of sustaining long-term permanence. If you aren't necessarily worried about the predictability and control of what you are extracting, these menstrua will work well for you. You can also add a small amount of alcohol to extend the preservation factor of these menstrua. Next, I'm going to talk about alcohol and water mixture, also known as an aqueous alcoholic menstruum, a mix of the two best solvents we have. If you think of every plant as having a rainbow of chemicals, some of which are most soluble in water or some of which are most soluble in alcohol, the purpose of the mixture is to try to capture the maximum spectrum of constituents. It allows you to get the advantages of a water extraction without the disadvantages of water's inability to preserve. Oil is a good solvent for many herbs with oil-soluble compounds and has a mild protective component that helps carry plant constituents to the skin as solves and lotions. As you might already know, oil does not mix with water or alcohol and is used on its own. There are two kinds of oils, fixed and volatile. Volatile, aka essential oils, are not actually oils at all, lacking fatty acids and glycerin and are referred to as volatile because they evaporate readily into the air. Fixed oils, on the other hand, are obtained from vegetables and animals and are chemically classified as fats. Glycerin is a component of fats and oils, and most commercial vegetable glycerin is made as a byproduct of coconut oil. It will also not mix with regular oils, but it will mix willingly with water and alcohol. We call an extraction in glycerin a glycerate, an alcohol-free, sugar-free, sweet-tasting extract that makes it popular for use with children or those who have blood sugar issues. It has a solvent power that is about half the strength of pure ethyl alcohol. The purpose of extraction is to pull out the unique chemical constituents of plants. When you make an extraction, the menstruum is absorbed and causes the cell walls of the plant or fungi to break down leading to direct contact with the menstruum, and the materials that were once inside the cells are released into the solution. Sometimes this is fairly easy, but other times the herb must be chopped into finer pieces in order to aid in the extraction, especially if the material is rather hardened, like many plant roots. Now science is very much preoccupied with the active ingredients and their specific actions on the body, but this does not paint the whole picture of an herb which has thousands of chemicals which perform complex synergies when together and in unison create powerful effects on the body. This is an outline of some of those actions. Alkaloids are organic bodies derived mostly from plants. They're bitter, slightly alkaline, and somewhat soluble in alcohol, less so in water. To prepare an herb for an alkaloid extraction, a menstrua of 35% water, 10% vinegar, and 55% alcohol is recommended. Balsams are resins or oleoresins soluble in alcohol and insoluble in water. Bitter compounds are soluble in water and soluble in alcohol, optimal being 30-60% to 60 alcohol. Camphors are closely related to volatile oils and are soluble in alcohol but insoluble in water. Essential oils or volatile oils are very soluble in alcohol, soluble in fixed oils and glycerin, slightly soluble in cold water and vaporized by boiling water. Enzymes are organic catalysts produced by animal or vegetable cells. Enzymes are soluble in water and insoluble in alcohol. 
Enzymes are inactive in alcoholic solutions and destroyed by high temperatures. Flavonoids are widely distributed plant constituents and they are all antioxidants which are fundamental to all of the colors other than green in plants. They are soluble in water, alcohol, and fixed oils. Glycosides are organic plant principles which contain a sugar part attached to a non-sugar part. Nearly all are soluble in alcohol with a 30 to 60% alcohol mixture being optimal. Gums are exudate soluble in water forming a jelly-like adhesive. They are insoluble in alcohol. Gum resins are milky exudates comprised of gum which are whole or partly soluble in water and resins soluble in alcohol. Mucilages. To extract mucilages you must use as low an alcohol content as possible and they are expressly soluble in water. Oils and fats as in fixed oils, are soluble in chloroform and ether, in volatile oils or other fats. Oleoresins occur in homogeneous mixtures with volatile oils and are soluble in alcohol and fixed oils, but insoluble in water. Proteins are soluble in water, insoluble in alcohol, and is coagulated by heat. Resins are non-volatile excretions and are oxidation products of essential oils. They're soluble in alcohol, fixed oils, and essential oils, and are insoluble in water. They will melt at around the temperature of boiling water. Saponins are plant components which foam when shaken in water. They help produce emulsions, and it's why they're found in soaps. They're soluble in water and soluble in dilute alcohol. Starches are a derivative of plant cells which are insoluble in ordinary solvents, but will become jelly-like in boiling water. Sugars are soluble in water and dilute alcohol. A huge number of sugars linked together is called a polysaccharide. And tannins are non-nitrogenous bodies which are very soluble in water, soluble in glycerin, and somewhat soluble in alcohol. To extract tannins, you'll want to use a 20% alcohol to 80% water ratio. And lastly, waxes. Waxes are compounds of fatty acids with certain alcohols which melt when heated and are brittle at low temperatures, and they have varying degrees of solidity. Most plants and fungi are made up of several of these constituents, so when you're thinking about how you're going to extract something and what kind of effect that you want to get on, on the body, you shouldn't necessarily be basing it off of the extraction of one single constituent. Alcohol concentrations from 40 to 60% are the most common, and using dilute alcohol is the best practical solution. To determine how much alcohol is in your vodka or other menstruum, you'll want to divide the proof number by 2 to find the percentage of absolute ethyl alcohol by volume. For example, 150 proof vodka contains 75% absolute alcohol. I'm going to start with water-based menstruums. The first is infusions. This is the most simple extraction you can do, basically a long brewed tea. Infusions can be hot or cold. Hot infusions are made from one part coarsely ground dried herb or two parts fresh herb to 20 parts boiling water, covering for 20 to 30 minutes and then straining. Cold infusions are also one part herb to 20 parts cold water letting the herb remain in the water overnight at room temperature and then straining. Herbs that work well as infusions include chamomile, dandelion, fennel, ginger, ginkgo, mugwort, mullein, nettle, oat straw, peppermint, St. John's wort, skullcap, and yarrow. The second kind of water extraction is called a decoction. And this is when you actually boil the herbs for a period of time in water or other fluids as opposed to an infusion where you're basically using boiling water but covering and letting sit in the fluid without continuing to boil it. A decoction comes from the Latin word decocere, meaning to boil down or away, and is reserved for herbs that need higher temperatures to extract, in which no loss of volatile principles are feared. Most times you're going to make a decoction to make sure that you extract the active constituents of herbs that are hard and woody in texture. Herbs which are resinous, which will become insoluble and inert under boiling heat, 
or herbs which contain volatile principles should never be decocted. Some examples of herbs that shouldn't be decocted include valerian root, peppermint, fennel, marshmallow, slippery elm, gumweed, and yerba santa. Always start your decoction in cold water to ensure that there's a complete extraction of all soluble principles from the herb by the gradually heated water. The reason for this is because adding herbs to already boiling water can cause coagulation and interfere significantly with the extraction of the chemicals. You can even let the herbs soak for a few hours before turning on the heat. After bringing to a boil, decrease heat and simmer for 15 minutes or so. Strain and press to get your final solution and cool. Examples of herbs that are well prepared as decoctions include black cohosh, burdock root, dandelion root, echinacea root, ginger root, mullen root, reishi, willow bark, and yellow dock. Herbal tinctures are always alcoholic or water alcohol solutions prepared from fresh or dried herbs. It is believed that a mixture of water and alcohol is the best solvent for extracting plant constituents and will dissolve nearly all of the desired chemicals of a plant while acting as a preservative. An herbal tincture should contain 45 to 60% alcohol and have an herb to menstruum ratio of one to four, although these ratios can vary. The potency of tinctures is generally considered to be stronger than dry plant equivalents taken in capsule form. Now many folks find it difficult to dose tinctures and they get a little confused as to how to know how much to take. To make an easy equivalence to something like a capsule, you can think of it this way. A 1 to 5 tincture of dried herb delivers the action of 20 grams of herb for each 100 milliliters of tincture taken. A 1 to 10 tincture delivers the action of 10 grams of dried herb and a 1 to 2 tincture of fresh plants carries the action of 50 grams of fresh herb with 100 milliliters of tincture taken. And if you're unfamiliar with milliliters, that's about 3.38 ounces. And you can always make tinctures to any strength that you desire, but the standard is usually one part herb to four parts liquid, or one part herb to five parts liquid, or what we call menstruum. There are two processes for tincturing an herb. The first is maceration, which requires no expensive equipment or complex procedures, but takes two weeks or more to finish. And the second is percolation, which usually does require equipment, but allows you to make tinctures in 24 hours. You need a percolator cone for this method, and I personally do not have one, but I'm open to it in the future. So with that said, I'm going to explain the folk method of tincturing, aka the maceration method. Step one will be to grind your herbs into a coarse chop or powder. If the herb should be infused, follow instructions for infusion. If the herb should be decocted, follow instructions for decoction. Either way, the first step is to make some form of a water extraction. Then you're gonna set your water extraction aside Take the strained herbs from your water extraction and you're going to put them into a tincture jar of choice. So you've already made your tea, you're finished with it, you've strained it, now you have these wet herbs that you just made your infusion with. You're going to put those in a jar. I like to use about a one liter bottle, but you can really make any size that you'd like. And then you're going to add two parts of your strained infusion into the jar. And then you're going to add two parts of overproof alcohol. So basically your liquids are going to be the same ratio, one to one. This should be at least 100 proof alcohol, but preferably 150 to 190 proof. You're going to stir well and cap the jar tightly. Optionally at this stage, you could choose to take your tincture blend and put it in the blender and just you know, really mix it up so that you get the best effectiveness from your extraction. So if you blended it, now put it back into its jar and you're gonna shake the tincture frequently at least once a day for 14 days. At the end of this 14 day process, you're gonna strain out the remaining herb material. And this is known as decanting. This is basically to get the, the most of the sediment out and just really have the infused liquid at the end although some sediment is naturally 
going to be a part of any tincture, especially if you've powdered something. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's more of an aesthetic thing, honestly. So you're going to bottle, cap, and label after that. And that's really it. That's the, the simplest way of, of making a herbal tincture. As long as you start with fresh or freshly dried ingredients, you're going to make wonderful medicine just with this process. I find alcohol tinctures to be an effective and reliable way of medicine making, and um, it seems to me like they're one of the best ways of doing it. And so that, that is my primary uh, choice when it comes to medicine making. But as I mentioned with all the different menstruum, there are other types of extractions that you can use. So I'm going to just go over briefly what those are. They're also quite simple and arguably even simpler than the double extraction that I just explained. So the first is wine and vinegar based menstrua infusions. This is usually when you macerate the herbs for 10 to 14 days in wine or vinegar and shake frequently. You can use things like sherry, port, Madeira wine, or mead for wine infusions. Usually the stronger alcohols are again going to be the best extractions. You can use glycerin to make a glycerite. Also, you can follow the general structure for macerating a powdered herb in the menstruum. Uh, and you're going to shake the glycerin, you know, herbs for 14 days before straining and bottling. Now, glycerin is going to be a little bit harder to strain because it's a thicker liquid, um, so it will take a little bit, but it will strain out and eventually you will be left with your finished glycerate. Then there's oil-based menstruums for oil infusions, and most people are familiar with oil infusions because of cannabis. It's best infused in oil and usually at a low temperature of around 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is useful for any herb that primarily holds oil-soluble constituents. So you want the oil to cover the herbs at least a quarter of an inch, shaking and stirring every few hours for several days. And when finished, and you're basically going to do the same thing again, strain and let the oil sit for a few days. And then you're going to decant again to remove excess sediment. Um, the reason for that is because it will spoil the oil faster than if you were to leave it in. So with oil infusions, it really is important to strain out the materials, whereas with an alcohol extraction, it's a little less important because it's not going to degrade in the alcohol the way it would in the oil. Oil infusions must be stored in a refrigerator or freezer in a tightly sealed jar to keep from going rancid, so they do have a shorter shelf life. And then there's sugar or honey menstrua, which can be used to make syrups. So you basically start out by making a normal herb infusion or decoction in water, and then you're going to set that aside. And then you're going to heat up your strained infusion with about one to one of sugar and honey and stir gently over the heat until it's dissolved. And as it, you know, actually simmers down and you take out some of that water content, you're going to basically be left with this thick syrup. So when you cool it, it's going to really congeal and become very syrupy texture to it. So that's basically it to make a, a medicated syrup. And you'll hear syrups used a lot more for cough medicines and things like that. Um, and also it's going to be more popular with children if, if you're interested in using herbal medicine with kids. As you can see, there's so much to learn about herbal extraction. I really could go on and on about this subject, but really I wanted this episode to just be an overview. Because since I've started sharing tinctures with others, I've noticed a lot of people want to learn how to make them for themselves. But I think the hardest part is really understanding the ratios, and probably the other hardest part is proper foraging techniques and feeling comfortable gathering herbs. But once you do, you can really have fun and experiment with the process of extraction. It's not as hard line as you think, and you don't have to feel like you're doing it wrong. You really can enjoy making, even if you make mistakes along the way, you can enjoy this process. And I think it's valuable that we all start practicing these skills of self-reliance, and that's why I wanted to make this episode. If you love herbs, I think you really shouldn't want to gatekeep them. You should want to share them and teach others how to share them too. 
And this, I believe, creates a paradigm shift in our ideas about what medicine is, what community is, and what healing is. And it also connects us to our various ancestries. And I hope that you learned something from this episode. Um, I really, I can't wait to see what you're going to come up with by interacting with your environment, whether it's an urban environment or a rural environment. Herbs really are our allies and they're everywhere. Um, So I wish you the best in your tincturing process. Let me know how it goes. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this show, please like, subscribe, and comment to let me know how I'm doing. This episode is brought to you by Polycultured, our farm resources blog. We're bringing you lots of info on backyard food production, sustainable living, and information about herbal antivirals and other types of earth medicines. If you enjoy this content, you can support us by ordering our products at www.polyculture.com slash order. This concludes episode 38 of the Someone Summer podcast. I hope you have a great night.